So this is fine because I, I was going to take up a little time at the beginning with some other introductions. This is the dangerous thing when you cooperate with other groups. Uh, the, the upside is you get to share audiences and help get the word out. The dangerous thing is you always run the risk that we're going to run at the beginning of the program and, and pitch our upcoming events. So, um, but let me just say another thing that I, I was going to say. Um, I'm here representing uh, the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences, New York chapter, of which I am the president. Uh, and uh, this evening's program is part of an ongoing series of lectures uh, that our two organizations are, are running, the SVU New York and also the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. Uh, and this is a, an ongoing ser series of lectures on uh, writers and literature um, from the Czech lands in Slovakia. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. With Jewish uh, writers and Jewish themes in in uh, um, literature from uh, the Czech lands and Slovakia, and I think this was sort of the brainchild of uh, of uh, Viera Kalina Levine from the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. And when she had this idea for a lecture series, she approached me at SVU to uh, collaborate with them and and help them both to publicize, but also to recruit speakers uh, for the series. Uh, and we kicked it off in uh, February, just before uh, lockdown in New York, with a, the, an initial lecture by Professor Yinjik Toman uh, from University of Michigan, who was speaking more generally about the process of emancipation for Jews living in uh, the Czech lands in Bohemian Moravia in the 19th century. Uh, and we're extremely happy uh, to have uh, Ann Jameson here uh, this evening to continue the series. Um, as uh, Pablo mentioned she's professor of English at the U University of, of Utah. Uh, her undergraduate education is from here in New York at, at Barnard College, uh, and her graduate education continued at the University of London and Princeton University. And she's the author of several books, including Kafka's Other Prague, Writings from the Czechoslovak Republic, which of course is going to uh, inform her talk this evening, but she is promised that uh, the talk this evening will also include material not included in the book. So, um, I'm, I'm really delighted to hear that. And just before I turn the floor over, uh, I have to plug two more SVU events coming up this week. Um, uh, one in cooperation with the Harriman Institute at, at uh, Columbia University and the um, East Central European Center. Uh, we uh, are having a discussion tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, with the director and uh, the producer of the film Blasnitsi, the owners, uh, which uh, what, had the most nominations for the, the Czech Academy Awards, the, the Czech Lion Awards for 2019. And uh, people have had the opportunity to view that film over the weekend. And so we'll have that discussion tomorrow at four. You can check uh, harriman.columbia.edu for the details on that. And then uh, a collaboration uh, between SVU New York and, uh, and the East Central European Center at, at the Harriman Institute of Columbia. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to have a talk by uh, Professor Mary Stegmeier from uh, the University of Missouri on uh, election observation and the democratic uprising in Belarus. And I'll just, uh, uh, for one second, um, share my screen here so you can see. Uh, this is just the, the homepage for SVU New York. And if you take that down, uh, um, svu2000.org slash New York you'll find uh, a link to that event on Wednesday. So I invite you all to come for that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, is there anything else, Pablo, you wanted to say by way of introduction before we turn the floor over to Anne? Um, I, I think Pablo had smoke in her building and had to leave. Oh, well, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, Pavla just probably would have wanted to welcome our audience on behalf of uh, the Society for History of Czechoslovak Jews. And I, I believe there's an event coming up in November that maybe if things uh, quiet down uh, where she... is, uh, she'll be able to maybe come back at the end of our camera and give the floor to you. All right, yes. Uh, and I just glitched out a minute. So somebody give me a heads up if that happens while I'm talking. Uh, hello, 
I am so happy to be here. Well, less happy to be here on my um, computer screen as we are now, but I'm so happy to be here uh, uh, to talk to you today about my um, 20 years of research and uh, material for my book, as we were saying, um, but also I decided to sort of uh, dive into my archives and bring a few um, treasures, I think, uh, At least I like to think so. So those 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 make their way in. Now, um, what I'm going to start presenting is the argument that I make um, over the over a, the course of an entire book. So uh, we're not getting all of it today. Today, uh, in honor of the Society of uh, the History of Czechoslovak Jews, I'll be focusing on uh, the the role, particularly of Czech Jews, in um, helping to construct what I call the Czechoslovak Kaka. So um, to begin with, I would, I would like to say that sometimes, uh, this has often happened to me over the past 20 years, uh, people will ask me, what, so was Kafka Czech or was Kafka German, if they know who Kafka is. Uh, and, but they ask this in the full expectation that they might receive a simple one word answer, but sadly, they learn this is not to be sadly for them, not for Kafka. Uh, Franz Kafka was a German speaking Jew from Prague he wrote in German, but he spoke Czech as well. He started life as a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, in the kingdom of Bohemia, to be exact, and died a citizen of Czechoslovakia, a country that did not exist when he was born and does not exist today. Uh, and that simplicity of identity and the way that it aligns with belonging um, is, <laughs> is paradigmatic of Kafka's entire life in so much as to say it was not simple at all and never was. Uh, so now I'm going to share my screen with you, I hope, uh, and show you a few pictures. That's me. Uh, but this is a picture, so this is a picture of the simple uh, map of what was then at the time of uh, Kafka's uh, birth, or this is a little bit later in uh, 1911, what the kingdom of uh, Bohemia looked like. And you can see from the color coding that uh, the Czech lands, uh, the Czech part of the Czech lands are there in blue and their little pink islands, which are islands of uh, German majority and all around the borders of the Czech lands, there, were, there was a ring of German speaking majority. Now, of course, these would have been more purple. Majority and minority doesn't mean a monolith. And so in fact, languages <laughs> were spoken all over. Uh, that was one of the problems with the Czechoslovak Republic. Uh, in found, founding itself. And I'm going to get that into a little bit. Uh, to, but in this time, uh, when Kafka was born, in this time of uh, Czechs and Germans sprawling all over, what was then the kingdom of Bohemia? It's probably important for my initial interlocutor who wanted to know whether Kafka was Czech or German, to know that Kafka Kafka's own father grew up um, outside of Prague in a rural area in a village where he and his family were speaking Czech, as was very common among rural Jews living in the kingdom of Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, it is also important to know that Kafka's father, Hermann Kafka, had a Czech sounding name, and this would prove helpful to him many times during, for example, riots when he would not be targeted by angry Czechs um, because he looked like a Czech owned business. And in fact, they would know he did speak Czech. Uh, so it's important to know my interlocutor that Kafka grew up speaking German with a Czech speaking father who also spoke German with Czech speaking servants and Czech speaking people all of around him. That sounds pretty basic, but it's very different from the story that was told about Franz Kafka for a very long time, which was that he lived essentially as if one of these little pink islands were a real thing and never had any contact with any Czechs um, or Czech culture. 
And that was a story that was told for a long time by Germanists primarily who had no access uh, to any research materials or indeed the Czech language. So that was a little bit overemphasized, although there was certainly isolation among the populations and many of the, many people in Kafka's circle would not have spoken Czech, would not have been introduced or would, would not have been interested in Czech culture. That did not apply to Kafka really at any time. Uh, so it's important to know for my interlocutor that despite this bilingual upbringing, Kafka wrote all of the literature for which he is known in German. It is important to note that he was sent to German gymnasium, that almost all of his friends, his close friends until later in his life were German identified Jews and his his uh, professional life until 1918 was likewise conducted primarily in German. So he didn't write in Czech hardly at all uh, until the end of his life. And even then, none of the writings for which he is known today. So at this point, the poor person who asked me, so is Kafka Czech or German has like long since checked out, their eyes are glazed over, they really wanted to hear about a bug, and now they're afraid they're never going to, and in fact they are never going to because he wrote about the bug a long time um, before, four years before uh, my story begins. So all that by way of saying, I'm never going to give a one word answer to that question, and I think it's wrong to do so. Uh, in part, this is, I think this is wrong because every potential one word answer risks not only being inaccurate, but also reinforcing some ideology that has proven harmful to people like Franz Kafka and other people who live near him. So to say that Kafka was Czech runs counter to an underlying ideology of the Czech nation state, um, since Kafka was a native German speaker. To say that he was German on this basis, however, counters the ideology of a different nation state that was later responsible for the slaughter of Kafka's family and the annihilation of the culture from which he emerged. To say that he was Jewish rather than Czech or German threatens to bolster the notion, apparently on the rise again in some places, that Jews are not ever properly European citizens and that their loyalties always lie elsewhere. So, I find those one word answers to be a problem, but such one word answers were what both the Imperial and the Czechoslovak census demanded. Um, now these senses were incredibly important, which I'll get into in a minute, uh, but how the questions were phrased um, was a matter of incredible controversy uh, really throughout Kafka's life. The big split um, being if you were asking what is your native language, that would be the Czechoslovak so uh, census, um, whereas what is your language of everyday use would be the Habsburg census. And the way that this question was answered, which meant to be soliciting a question about identity and not just about language, the way that you framed that question would change the answers that determined your identity in terms of the state. So the state could manipulate what kinds of answers they got in the way that would best suit their political ends. Um, what you would get by answering these questions in one way or another is representation in government, in schools, in terms of resources. So while bilingualism was a reality for many, many people living uh, in the Czech lands at this time, it was not a census option. It was never a census option. And so identification with one group depleted the, uh, the official population count of the others. It was a zero sum game. This caused a lot of tension. Um, and language is a flawed proxy. So if you had only had the option to be educated in German because there wasn't a, lang there wasn't a school near you uh, in Czech because of the small population of Czechs around you, then you would have had to have been speaking German. If you were speaking German for work, you would have to be speaking German. You might be speaking German a lot, um, but you might be feeling Czech, uh, but there was no way to, there was no way to, um, to indicate that. So these Prague tensions around identity and language were never fully resolved and they're still being argued about today. So we can see this to the, by the extent to which institutions in Germany and Great Britain and the Czech Republic and Israel continue to argue about who can lay claim to the Bohemian German Jewish Czechoslovak writer Kafka's literary legacy. 
Nobody's going to say that, right? Uh, most recently, Israel's Supreme Court ruled that Max Broad, uh, Kafka's friend, uh, that his literary estate, including unpublished works by Kafka, should remain in the National Library in Jerusalem. Judith Butler has contended that Kafka was not a German writer, but was certainly Czech. Pascal Casanova identifies Kafka as a Yiddish writer, although that was not a language that he knew. Uh, and David Sucha further emphasizes Kafka's Jewish languages, arguing persuasively uh, for the interlinguistic play with Hebrew and Yiddish in Kafka's later works, which I also uh, see. Uh, but, but for me, the fact that Kafka also turned more seriously to the study of Hebrew in his last years only further attests to his changing and fluctuating relationship to language and languages during those years. Um, his, this relationship to Jewish culture, including Jewish languages, has been subject to intensive research already, and I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's been influential. It's been important. Um, but this is really far from true. Uh, about his relationship to Czech language and culture, um, work by Czech scholars and Slavicists not, well, notwithstanding, and a lot of it is really excellent and I've relied on it. Uh, it, it hadn't until fairly recently started to make its way into the broader conversation about Kafka. Uh, so in practice, one of, the, one of the, the big claims that it turned out that I needed to make in this book that was aimed at you know, Kafka scholars that I didn't really anticipate that I would have to make was that Czech was also a language of Prague Jewry. In 1910, 15, or 54% of Bohemian Jews overall declared Czech as their language of everyday use. In Prague, German-speaking Jews were far more common, but Czech-speaking Jews were prominent in Czech journalistic and print culture, precisely in those venues that first published Kafka in translation. So I'm just going to say as an illustration of how complicated this got, I want to show this map of some Czechoslovakias, uh, and this goes, shows, I'm not going to go into it all, but it shows the changing borders of the state and its color coded for different times. So this fact of bilingualism and dispersed populations um, that didn't actually map on to a, a, a relatively stable border continue to cause problems. So in, in, in essence, it wasn't just Kafka that was having a bit of an identity crisis for much of this time period. Um, but what I want to turn to now, um, but first I just want, I wanted to make the point that although Kafka did was born in one country and died in another. He hardly ever left in his dwelling this square, uh, Old Town Square uh, in Prague. He was born in that house and then he moved, he moved to a few apartments uh, now and again, but he lived at this place, which now houses, I think the Czech tourism ministry and some very fancy shops. Uh, right across, right, right across from what is now Jan Hus. He had a great view of Jan Hus's butt, um, and he would comment that he had lived almost his entire life in this in this um, one single square. So, given that, it's sometimes you know hard to see. Well, what difference did this all make to him? He continued to work in the same company. He continued to live in the same house. He continued, sadly, to suffer from the same terrible lung disease, tuberculosis, uh, and. Um, he continued to consider himself Jewish, but uh, also conflicted with that um, identity as well. However, he really, um, a lot changed uh, for him with, and not only because of, but with the founding of the Czechoslovak Republic and the first Czechoslovak Republic in 1918. So I don't want to make any claims at any time, as hopefully is now clear, about Kafka's true ethnic identity. I'm not arguing that in these later years, Kafka became Czech identified, that Czech became his primary language, that it eclipsed his interest in Hebrew, or that Czech literature became his greatest influence. Other people can fight about all of that. Rather, what I want to do is in contrast to the either or logic of the nation state and the empire uh, and the census, my central claim is that in response to a changed political, professional, and personal linguistic landscape, the Czechoslovak Kafka's relationship, relationship to languages is best characterized by a heightened awareness of proximity and multiplicity and shift. So,
when in, in, in focusing on this Czechoslovak Kafka, I make a case in my book, and I'm not going to make this entire case now, but I make a case in my book for the increased importance of Czech on the basis of four distinct areas that constantly overlap. On the one hand, political changes, um, the change to a nation state defined and delimited by the Czech language placed German speaking Jews uh, and German speakers in the position of being a minority in a Czech led space, whereas they had been a sort of more ruling minority in a German led space. Uh, that caused a lot of changes for Kafka, including in his professional life. Uh, because he knew Czech suddenly, and he had this Czech sounding name, he was able to keep his job at the Workers Insurance Institute where he worked because he knew Czech and could write, could write in Czech, although he was constantly asking his new Czech brother-in-law um, for help with some of the intricacies of Czech. For those of you who may not know, written Czech, especially back then, was a very different thing from spoken Czech for complex, <laughs> for complex reasons. Uh, but just because you could speak Czech very well did not necessarily mean you could write um, correct Czech particularly. Um, fluently. So he would, he would ask for help um, from time to time for bureaucratic check. Uh, but so because of this, um, and as well as any interest, he began to read Czech much more extensively. If you want to be writing Czech, you're going to need to be reading Czech. Uh, and he was now living in a Czech country and sort of decided he was going to look at more Czech materials. And so he starts reading um, pretty extensively in some of the very interesting uh, periodicals and newspapers that grew up around the, the beginning of the of the Czech Republic. Not that they hadn't not that they hadn't been there before, but Kafka starts paying attention to them, and a few are founded. And I'm going to focus on those a bit. Uh, the final area in which, and by no means the least important, probably more important for Kafka than um, professional or political, um, certainly not more important than uh, than writerly, um, but they overlap. The, his personal life became a lot more Czech uh, because he fell in love with his translator, uh, the Czech writer Milena Jasenska, uh, and wrote to her constantly. He wrote in German, she wrote in Czech, uh, but he also obsessively followed all of her publications in these um, interesting magazines. Uh, this, this fact that there was a woman writer kind of blew his mind because although there were women writers everywhere. In his mind, somehow women were on the one side and writing, which God wanted him to do was on the other. And famously, God wanted him to marry, but God wanted him to write. And he couldn't possibly do both at the same time somehow. He had some issues. Um, but uh, the, the idea came to him that, that, that if women in writing could become a little bit closer, that that opened up all kinds of, pop of, of possibilities for him that he hadn't really considered. Um, and that if they were writing in Czech, that was sort of even more intense, but she was married and he was dying. So it, it, it didn't work out that well. But the, the sort of potential for this and the explosion of interest in just the Czech language, because all of the texts he cared most about in life, which were Milena Jasenska's letters at this point, uh, and her journalism was suddenly in Czech. And, and for somebody who thinks a lot and thinks a lot about language, like we could really say Franz Kafka did, um, that was a big deal. So, Related to this, Kafka's work also began appearing in Czech, not because he had written it, but because it was translated. And it was also appearing in these interesting uh, uh, magazines and newspapers that were springing up around the time. So the context of his publication and the way in which his, his work was being made available and his work was being consumed and read changed in this regard. And again, for somebody who's thinking quite a lot about Franz Kafka, as we know he did, that was also a big deal. So for those reasons, I say that um, in the last six years of his life, uh, after uh, 1918, uh, the Czech language and literature and culture became much more of a big deal to Kafka, and we should pay attention to it. Uh, so I am now going to go to this interesting, this is one of the interesting, uh, most interesting publications, I think, that I came across in my research for this book. Um, and when I want to, th this, this Czech language daily, um, 
was tremendously important in Prague at this time. It didn't have a huge uh, circulation, but it was important because it was a Jewish Czech publication. It was basically liberal. It was, um, it covered all the news, it's a very good magazine, but it, pub it, it, it covered it in Czech in a way that was not ever going to be brutally anti-Semitic the way that some of the main publications in Czech, the newspapers could be, the prime example of that being Venkov, which was the, uh, the, the magazine or the, the newspaper, the daily newspaper of the Czech agrarian um, party. And was very, you know, Czech chauvinism was very big and anti-Semitism was very big. But of course it was a driving force behind um, the founding of the Republic and supported the Republic, even though the Republic was not, um, did not embrace many of its views. However, uh, Venkov, not Tribuna, but Venkov was also important in that his cultural section published almost all of the major Czech writers of, of the day, and or many of them anyway, especially the, the more mainstream ones. And so the, the, the union of contemporary Czech letters with this, um, this publication that could be so anti-Semitic and so uh, chauvinistic was you know, problematic for people who might be wanting to read those, those writers. It, 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 it causes a, 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 an, associate, an association effect. So Tribunov, when it comes out, is able to present writers in Czech uh, without that context. Uh, and when it does, uh, when it does deal with issues of anti-Semitism as it is going to in this, this article uh, about a brochure about the Jewish question, it does so critically and it does so in the Czech language. And that was a big deal. So I just um, have a couple here, just a couple of excerpts from that uh, to show how it was framed. Um, it's, it, it, the articles in Tribuna are also often very sensitive to nuances of language. They're sometimes ironic. Uh, they're in this case obviously quite obviously very critical of uh, this this pamphleter but just the fact that these that these kinds of um just the fact that these kinds of statements and these kinds of criticisms were coming in a mainstream uh magazine that was in check uh that was aimed at jews was it was a big deal at this time it resonated and it resonated in, in a way in part because it was employing a lot of kafka's friends including uh milana yasinska and it was publishing kafka it was also publishing ladislav klima uh who is just an extraordinarily strange writer not jewish uh if it but 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 not really much of anything else either. Uh, he was, I think you could say, iconoclastic. I found it interesting when I first started doing research on this that Ladislav Klima and uh, Franz Kafka were appearing in the same publication uh, close together uh, in time because that was not a story that I had ever heard before that they would have had anything to do with it. It, it turns out, it turns out there was this guy who would go around and sort of say, oh yeah, Kafka knew all these Czech writers and I introduced them, uh, Michal Maresh. Uh, there's not really any evidence that Kafka actually met Ladislav Klima anywhere except on the pages of this um, of this periodical. Um, but it's an interesting it's an interesting juxtaposition nonetheless. And for my own purposes in in literary studies, these kinds of juxtapositions, where suddenly you know something that has been presented to you as being very very separate uh, for a long time is suddenly showing up on the same like literally on the same page. Um, it's worth thinking about. And this was something that I wanted to think about a little bit. Um, so uh, Ladislav Klima uh, is extraordinary that he would have had anything to do with Kafka at all. Um, they, uh, despite being con almost exact contemporaries and enjoying considerable posthumous success, uh, this coincidence of publication is perhaps even more remarkable be because Ladislav Klima and Franz Kafka shared almost nothing else, except this little cluster of attributes. They wanted to have all of their um, works burned, except, you know, Klima would burn his works and Kafka thought that his friend would do it, or supposedly thought his friend would do it. Um, and, and he didn't, so we have all his novels, which we wouldn't have had otherwise. Apparently, Ladislav Klima uh, burnt 90% um, of his own work during his lifetime. Um, 
Like Kafka, he died of tuberculosis in the 1920s. His best known novelistic works were only published posthumously. He tended towards aphorism. This, this piece here is a collection of aphorisms. Um, but that's really where any similarity ends. Um, Klima was famously kicked out of all of the schools in Austria uh, for insulting the Habsburgs and literally everything else. Uh, he would never compromise his principles of self-determination and will, he's a big Schopenhauer fan, um, by, by holding a job. Uh, that was something he, 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 he would eat vermin, literally eat vermin before he would do that. Uh, he wrote works of philosophy as well as fictional works, but his fictional works uh, detailed acts of literally still shocking, if philosophically compelling, um, sexual per perversion um, and the idea that he in any way re resembled um, the abstemious contained and dutiful Kafka who devoted so much of his time to an office job he took seriously but never loved it's a little bit insane um, but in this shared space these juxtapositions um, become interesting and so I wanted to just show a couple of places where Klima could have been speaking to Kafka specifically on the subject of nationalism and language. I'm not going to read all of this, um, but I'd be happy to send it. Uh, and what I, the, the point that I want to make here is that he is saying that the, the, the Czech word for German is at the heart of Czech hatred for German because it is an ugly word. This is not the kind of argument that mainstream um, uh, people in Benkoff say who are talking about the antagonism between Germans and Czechs were making. Um, even stranger uh, is this is this article in um, uh, Tribuna, this this uh, Czech Jewish publication uh, by Ladislav Klima that gets ex this extraordinary um, note. Um, so, whoops, not there. It says, if we print, if we print this contribution of the philosopher Ladislav Klima, it is for the depth and fundamentality of his argumentation. We are, as is well known, at the opposite pole. And yet life is not made up of mere philosophical radicalism of Klima's type, nor the facts of ethical pragmatism. Uh, behind which we ourselves, uh, or where, where we ourselves stand in, in matters of chauvinism. and goes on. Oops. So they have this kind of disclaimer. And when you're first reading it, it sounds very straightforward. Um, he says, you know, only taken together can these, can these two uh, paths really be called life. Um, but only, only if uh, we, we assume that um, these views issue from was sort of a, an intrinsically genuine perspective. And then for the first time, Ladislav Klima fulfills this condition of essentially authenticity, they're gonna say. And for this reason, we are happy to give him space. And I remember reading that and thinking like, who are they reading? Like what happened here? Uh, and that, that's what, um, it's very sort of, I, 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 it's an entirely ironic exercise. Um, and so here is, uh, here, is, here is his defense of, uh, here is his defense of chauvinism. Um, with this word, we now name uh, patriotism that is exaggerated, uh, stubborn, blinded, indifferent, ravenous, overestimating its nation and unjust to others. But this is generally pleonasm. Depravity is often just the just the obscene name we give to soft and reckless depth and truthfulness. It is resting deeply in your cause, in yourself. Whoever does not know that love is on the one hand clairvoyance and on the other hand, enormous blindness. And as a result of this indifference, raggedness, overestimation of the beloved, predatory hatred of the enemy, whoever does not know that love is total intoxication, irrationality, hyperbole, bigotry, etc., does not know what love is. Either decree that patriotism is not love or give it all the predicates that belong to sexual love and maternal love and so on. Behold the man in love, in an ordinary goose, he will see a queen, a nymph, a goddess, even her faults glow brighter for him. Nothing will convince the heart of the beholder of the opposite, 
the whole world is disappearing for him. At her command, he would blow up every derogatory word of her, perhaps quite innocent and innocently and perhaps quite rightly, he would be ready to take bloody revenge. And it goes on in this, he's, he's a little bit overwrought, uh, but it goes on in this, in this way. So the point is that, that, that encountering this kind of Czech writing was, a, was new for Kafka. He had studied Czech writing uh, like Božena uh, Nemcova in school. And then he really hadn't paid attention very much to what we might call the cutting edge of Czech uh, letters. And we can see this from his correspondence in the years prior to the, the time that I'm talking about. He really, he just, he rarely mentions them. And if he does, it's sort of dismissive. Um, encountering this kind of strange and multiply ironic um, and really sort of finely wrought prose was new for him. And he, he doesn't comment on Klima, but he co comments say on uh, other writers uh, who are doing this kind of thing. Um, so this publication uh, was important for him, but it wasn't important for him only because of the things that it was publishing. It was publishing, it was important for him also because um, his friends worked there and uh, Milena Jesenska uh, published there. And so when he was obsessed with Milena Jesenska, he used to go to their offices to just hang around and see if maybe they would say his name. Um, this was re it recounted in his, in his letters. Now, the, the editor of this publication, uh, whose birth name was Arno Schlostig, uh, but went by Arne Lauren, uh, he was somebody that Kafka mentions visiting and hoping, you know, hoping to ask after Milena Jesenska, who's at the time living in Vienna and writing letters from Vienna to the Tribuna, uh, and then um, Lauren would, would mention her. Um, but he would also mention, you know, other things. Uh, in one instance from his letter, uh, Kafka reports to Yesenska that Lauren was able to tell Kafka that he hadn't heard of anything bad happening to Yesenska and even tele telephoned to Egon Erwin Kitsch, another journalist who is interested in um, translation and uh, uh, inter-ethnic, interlinguistic cooperation and a different paper. Uh, so Lauren asked him to make inquiries about Milena Yesenska's well-being for Kafka. Uh, so so I was sitting at Lawrence, Kafka said, I heard your name mentioned several times and I was grateful to him. Even so, talking to him is neither easy nor pleasant. Kafka likens Lauren to a child, a braggart and a liar, but also to a quote, big serious grown up when it comes to kindness, sympathy and the readiness to help. So as distressed as Kafka finds himself by this combination in Arne Lauren, the Czech Jewish, Czech German Jewish um, bilingual uh, editor of this newspaper, um, he hangs around anyway and, and kind of a stalker vibe. Um, so the associations, while this is an important paper for him and an important paper overall for Kafka were hardly uniformly uh, positive. It wasn't just, it wasn't just uh, Lauren that could kind of rub him the wrong way. There had been a suicide in the newspaper's offices. A young editor there uh, had killed himself in, he heard about in June of 1920 when he was sort of at the height of this intensive obsessive correspondence uh, with Milena Yesenska and as he was translating her or as she was translating him rather and he was helping with her, her with other translations. Kafka received word from Max Broad about this suicide, which had happened in the previous February, and, and it was now getting an explanation. It was the result of an unconsummated affair with a Christian, a Czech woman, a friend of Milena Jesenska. So the, the, the German Jewish or the Jewish Czech, uh, rather, editor of uh, Tribuna, um, the Jewish editor killed himself because of, an, because of having fallen in love with a Czech Gentile um, friend of the woman that Kafka was in love with. And so this made a big impression on him. And Max Broad, writing to him at this time, because Kafka was away trying to recover from tuberculosis, Max Broad had no idea that Kafka was involved um, with Milena Yesenska, or probably wouldn't have told him this story in quite this way. Um, so... He learned that he learned that 
this woman, the, or sorry, excuse me, the wife of this, um, the wife of this uh, young editor was having an affair with yet another German Jewish friend of Kafka's, uh, and that the woman was also a translator, um, Yar Yarmila uh, at the time, Ambrozova, later uh, Hasova, Nechasova. She's a very interesting woman, um, and should not by any way be be determined by by her relationships, but she was at the time, in the way that Kafka was thinking, having an affair with this acquaintance of his really Haas, uh, a German Jewish friend, and th there were just too many parallels there. So that sort of put this magazine in a, or this, this newspaper in a, in a different kind of box for him. Um, but even after having heard about this, he goes back to the Tribune's office, uh, misses him, and uh, meets the young poet Michal Marish, who would later go around claiming to have introduced Kafka to basically everyone, um, Marish sits him down on the sofa where the young man had uh, killed himself, where Marish had been with him that evening, um, and told him all about it in all the gory details. So anyway, uh, apparently, well, I, I don't need to go there. That's the true enough. So very interesting publication in many ways, um, really, possibly changing Kafka's relationship to Czech, but not only in a positive way. Uh, in its own right, though, it really is paradigmatic of the kind of cultural efforts and institutions that were launched in these early days of Czechoslovakia. It was helmed and staffed by people who wanted to mix with one another, who were bilingual, who wanted to work across stereotypes toward new configurations of language and identity and cultural and political affiliations. It was a formidable cultural force far beyond its influence on Kafka and beyond its immediate circle of influence in the Czech Jewish community. Um, and then another paper uh, swiped its editor and it started to go downhill. Um, that paper was another paper that was um, largely helmed by uh, Jews, both German and Czech identified. Um, and it was uh, the, Prague, the, the, the Prague Presse, the, the newspaper of, um, sponsored by the new Czechoslovak government to present uh, the views of the, the government, um, a, friendly, uh, a friendly version of the the news um, friendly to the government and uh, Czech, Czech culture in translation alongside German culture. So again, trying to bridge this gap between uh, Germans who hadn't been interested in Czech culture and um, and the Czech culture themselves. So here you see R U R or R U R is getting um, is is getting serialized. This is Chopik's uh, most famous pay, play that gives us the word ro robot. It's getting serialized um, in the feuilleton space of this paper. Uh, now, Max Broad was, uh, was an editor there, Kafka's dearest friend, Oscar Baum, a translator um, who was one of Kafka's dearest friends as well, both worked at this paper, and it also published Kafka alongside Czech writers. Um, it published his last story, uh, uh, Josephine the singer, uh, and um, it was, it, as I said, it, it, it was sort of, it, it moved from the Tribuna over to this German language publication in the shape of uh, Arne Lauren. So this was also a big cultural force, and as Kafka was certainly reading it, despite having had some misgivings about the sort of propagandistic uh, nature of the publication, he would have found these amazing, you know, it, it liked to have these, these sort of full, full spreads of presenting, well here, you know, um, Slovak architecture to uh, German speaking readers who might not know about these interesting buildings. And then, um, other, there are many of these kinds of pages where they would present uh, uh, Czech arts and culture um, to, transposed and translated into, into German. Um, so with these, with these publications, Kafka becomes a part of, um, and with these publications and in his private life as well, Kafka becomes a part of these efforts to uh, bridge the gap between Czech and German culture and to sort of help heal um, 
or at least help acknowledge that they were not always um, fighting on, on, on separate sides and acknowledging just through by, by, by sharing spaces in these magazines that they were a part of a shared culture in a way uh, that was not always given account and to this day isn't um, giving account and not that this shared culture um, was always so was always so easy or so nice or not that Kafka's relationship to the Czech language and culture was always fantastic. He did also explain that he experienced Czech like the blow of a fist sometimes. Um, it's nonetheless it deserves a lot more attention than than it has had. Now I as I have been, as I have been doing this kind of research, I became really fond of these publications. And in my book, I, I, I cover a lot more of them. There were important art publications that were also uh, publishing Kafka or uh, publications that were um, featuring a lot of Josef Chapek graphics um, alongside uh, work from the Deviat Seal and really trying very hard to get to the more sort of cutting edge of what was really new and interesting in Czech culture and trying to present it alongside of what was really new and interesting um, in, in German culture, presenting it in Czech. And that's how sort of excerpts of Franz Kafka's uh, 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 novel, uh, Der Fashioner, the America, was, was, first, was first published um, in Czech. So, I became fond of them. And it was one of the things that was really sad about this whole project is the way that they would not necessarily fail, but change. So that Tribuna eventually fell on hard times and was bought by the Czech Agrarian Public Party, the, the, the people that were running Venkov, the very people that they had been founded to sort of push back against. Um, and uh, Kman, one of the one of the magazines that I talk about a lot in my books, I didn't want to go into t to it today. It eventually it was a socialist publication, and a lot of these a lot of these people that were most interested in kind of creating this cross cultural exchange, um, they were socialist or left leaning. Um, and so it was, you know, nationalism wasn't necessarily uh, aligned with uh, international. So, but, but it was a, a socialism that was eclectic and sort of vibrant and trying to um, show, show how many different ways and for how many different people um, socialism could work. Uh, but then Kamen sort of uh, undergoes a change and it becomes a very sort of straight up doer, straight party line with, with none of the, the nice pictures that it had before. And you see this happen sort of again and again. And of course, um, we know how this worked out. You know, we, we know that these these people who were trying so hard sort of didn't didn't win. They didn't carry the, the day. That shared culture got wiped out, uh, and um, at least the the sharedness part of it. And uh, as I was doing, as I was writing this book and looking through these publications and seeing how hard they were trying and how. Uh, important and forgotten their contributions were not just to Kafka, um, which I go into kind of at a granular level, the way that these, these kinds of conflicts inform, especially his uh, last unfinished novel, uh, Das Schloss, if you see like that, that building in, the, in Slovakia looks kind of like what was pictured there. I mean, there are, there are many sources, there are many sources for Das Schloss, but it was, uh, it seems Czech. Um, to me, there's a lot. So I, I go, I think that kind of literary reading is, is less interesting for this kind of a talk. So I'm not going uh, to go to go there. Uh, but so, I mean, rather, I would like to sort of wrap up and um, take some questions if, if that would be okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, uh, that, that you've given us a lot to chew on here. Uh, and uh, we've already had some uh, questions come into the Q&A function. I would encourage our audience, if they have additional questions, to submit them through that uh, uh, Q&A function. Um, Wait, I just I forgot I forgot to share Nash Skowki, which is my ah. favorite thing that I ever found. Um, it's just this picture. It was it was uh, it was a a little novel about a little Czech scout that Kafka read and somehow 
at the same time as Dostoevsky, and there's this little note, and nobody knew what it was, and I found it. Um, and it was about this young Czech boy who goes out to the, he's sort of sickly, and like, a, like he lives in the city, and he's sort of sickly, and then he goes out into the country and becomes more healthy. And I felt like it was like the exact opposite of the way that Kafka was seeing himself. Um, and so anyway, there they are. It's not really <laughs> apropos of anything else. I just am fond of it. There's my book. All right, now I'm gonna stop sharing this and hope that I can see the questions. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll give you the choice of sifting through them yourself if there's stuff you'd like to respond to right away. Ah, um, so let's see. I'm going to uh, take this question from anonymous attendee. Uh, the question is, did the census categorize Jews as a separate race pre-1918 and after 1918 in the new Czechoslovak nation state thing? And yes, uh, yes in the 19, after 1918 and no uh, previous to that. Uh, so the, the Czechoslovak uh, constitution um, and the census gave the option of Jewish as an ethnic identity rather than having to choose between one of the other uh, minority languages that kind of made the cut. Um, and that was, that was a big deal. But everyone, when I came, every one of these questions caused, also caused tension because if you were chewing choosing Jewish uh, as, as, you know, people, you know, there's a quite a big Zionist movement at the time that, that Max Broad, for instance, was, was involved in. If you were choosing Jewish, then you weren't choosing German. And so the German numbers would go down. Uh, and, since, and since actual resources were being apportioned in accordance with that, uh, those numbers, um, that led to some tensions. Uh, and so anytime you have that kind of a question, it, that's that was what was happening. So basically, no matter what the Jews did, somebody was going to res resent them for for affiliating with that other group. And that was that was a constant, and it didn't stop. It didn't stop with with Czechoslovakia. I would like to be able to say that it did. Um, will the slides be available? Well, it's recorded. Can I make the slides available? Uh, I mean, of course, people will be able to review most all the slides that you showed when they when they go to look at the the video on YouTube. I guess it's up to you. Um, uh, and if you wanted to post them, I'm I'm happy I'm happy to post them where where wherever. Um, yeah, my my clippings my clippings from the archive. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, let's see. Uh, so yes, and if if somehow that doesn't work, you can write to me, and I will send you them. Um, origins of the name Kafka. Ah, Kafka, uh, meaning jackdaw, a kind of bird, was the kind of name that was assigned to Jews to sort of humiliate them. Um, uh, previ you know, f further back in the history, you know, this is how uh, uh, Jews got names like, you know, button maker and things like that, that, you know, they weren't necessarily button makers. Somebody just maybe thought it was fun. Um, lots of names of animals and things. And so it was, it was, in that in that spirit um but uh the jackdaw was uh herman kafka's kafka's father that was his his um motif um his brand for his store so he embraced it can um, i just follow up with yeah, that absolutely. uh is, is kafka a name that occurs among non-jewish czechs uh yes yeah so it's it, it's a little ambiguous potentially right well, I mean, the names, I have a whole long, I have a whole long uh, discussion of names in my book because of the name Klam, which is the name of the <laughs> official in the castle. That is a name, it, it is a name, and with two M's, it's German, it's a German word. With one M, it's a Czech word. And these names are going back and forth between Czech and German all of the time. Uh, and people are Germanizing or Czechifying them, adding, you know, and so, so there was, there was sort of a, 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 an illusion that there were clearly delineated names, um, but there, there weren't actually clearly delineated names. And um, many German speakers had Czech sounding names and not Wapak, <laughs> the other way around. Right. Uh, let's see, okay. In 1921 census, which nationality did Kafka claim uh, for himself? Oh, I have no idea because those are, those are anonymous. I don't know. Uh, that, that would be a nice thing, a nice thing to know. I mean, he did say, he, he was famous for saying, well, I mean, not at the time, but, but he's famous now for saying things like, you know, what do I have in common with the Jews? I hardly have anything in common with myself. Um, he was not, um, 
he did not have an unconflicted, well, he didn't have an unconflicted relationship to like <laughs> literally anything, but certainly not to any of his potential identities. Um, there are many castles through Czechoslovakia. Is there, any, is there a particular reason why he chose to write about the castle in Bratislava? He didn't choose to write any, about any single castle. There are just, there are a lot of, there, there are all kinds of theories about which castle he was writing about. He was writing about an abstract quasi-cubist castle that had a lot in common with various, um, uh, well, really, uh, more like chateaus. There's not really quite an English word for the kind of castle that he was talking about. So it's really actually not the kind of castle that was in Prague, the, the castle in Prague, the Hrat. Um, but, um, but that was nonetheless also part of it. So it's not that it couldn't have been that, but there's no way there's a one-to-one. -one. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship with anything ever <laughs> in Kafka. That just puts an end right to that. Uh, what language did Kafka's mother speak? She was a German speaker, and in part for that reason, they decided to, to raise um, the children in German um, because they, the relationship was conducted in German. Um, and it gave, gave people an advantage, certainly, um, at that time, and then it didn't later. Uh, would you consider uh, Kafka primarily a philosopher or a novelist? I would say he was a writer, and of all of the identities that he could claim, that was the one he most wanted. Um, I wouldn't call him a novelist since he really never finished any of his novels that didn't want any of them published. I wouldn't call, call him a philosopher because there were lots of philosophers all around, and he was sort of interested in philosophy, but he really rejected that. But I mean, of course, he's both those things. Uh, let's see. I, I was wondering if Kafka ever expressed nostalgia for the pre-1914 period in his writings, or if he ever made explicit his thoughts on the First Republic. Um, I do not recall any kind of nostalgia for the pre-1914 period in, in, those, in those terms. Um, He's not a particularly nostalgic writer. Well, he is and he isn't. He's always, you get the sense of nostalgia, but for something that like isn't there. Uh, actually, Walter Benjamin writes about this is, and, and, and Adorno as well, um, two critics who are pretty good on Kafka who write about how he has the sense of like yearning back to this, this time that is too primordial to be there, but that wasn't um, pre-1914 um, Bohemia, I think. Um, whether he may, he didn't have a lot of um, explicit political uh, treatises anywhere in his writings, but he did have, you know, he had thoughts about, um, he certainly had thoughts and you can find them in his, um, in his writings, but I mean, he was alternately, you know, hopeful about it, I think, but he wasn't, he wasn't, I would say, a big fan of government. I mean, there are all these, always these uh, rumors that he was hanging out with an Antichrist, those are probably not totally true, but but they weren't completely untrue either. I mean, he had, he was not a, he was, he was, I wouldn't say that he was not a political person, but he was not a political person in a way that particularly aligned with any of the politics of his, of his day. Um, my father also grew up as a Czech Jew in Prague, bilingual in German and Czech. Oh, cool. His father was a very strong Czech nationalist and believer in founding Czechoslovakia as a republic. Why, yes, and there were lots of them. There was a big movement and uh, um, it, it sometimes divided families. Uh, in fact, in, in my book, I talk about, about uh, one family where, um, where the, the, the one son goes like full on, like sort of caftan wearing uh, Orthodox Jew, and the other goes on to become like a best friend of the president of, uh, and, 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 and a well-known um, Czech writer. And th that, that kind of thing was not uncommon. Um, there's, uh, there's some really good books about that that I could put in links. I mean, I have things about that, but if you're really particularly interested in that history and that more political history, um, there's now excellent um, research on it. Um, Czechs, Germans, and Jews is the name. Is, I think it's, I, I, I would even be able to find it for this, I think, in a minute. Um, Kafka and Yiddish Theater in Prague info, please. Um, sure. Uh, this was the, the, Kafka has a journal in, entry about Kafka, uh, about Yiddish theater that was the basis for a very influential um, piece of writing um, uh, called Fr Franz Kafka Toward a Minor Literature, in which he talks about the literature of minor countries. Um, 
he was really interested in Yiddish theater. He writes um, really enthusiastically about this troupe of, of, of Yiddish, uh, uh, Yiddish actors that comes through. He, you know, he tried to study Yiddish, he didn't know it well, but he thought they had a kind of, I mean, in a kind of a bogus way, he thought they had this great authenticity that he didn't have. There was a lot of sort of like romanticizing of these kinds of more Eastern Jews and their more authentic Czech, or their, their authentic um, Jewish languages like Yiddish. Um, and he was very, he was very enthusiastic about that. So that was a real enthusiasm. It's an interesting um, journal entry, but um, part of the point that I make in, in my book is that that, that journal entry was um, a long time before there was a Czechoslovakia and that you shouldn't take his, um, that you shouldn't take that work. Cause he also then talks about, he talks about um, Czech literature um, as also like Yiddish being a, a, a literature of small nations. And then this, this, essay that I'm not a big fan of then makes it sound as if actually he was talking about the way that he spoke German, which he wasn't. But anyway, that being as it may, it's an interesting essay. Um, and this Yiddish theater enthusiasm of Kafka is interesting. And again, there's a lot of work done on Kafka and Yiddish, um, not by me, but by people who know Yiddish. Um, uh, is, uh, is there evidence of Kafka's view of the formation of the Republic? Again, not like, not totally, not totally straight on. I mean, often, you know, he's worried about shortages. He's worried about riots. He's, um, he's worried in general and thinking maybe he should emigrate and starts learning, um, starts learning Hebrew, Hebrew. So reading around, you can find sort of different ways in which he thought about the new Republic. But again, as I said before, not, um, not particularly a booster, um, but not a booster of the opposite either. Uh, let's see, will this talk be available on YouTube? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, add Jews who chose had Jews who chose German on the 1930 census and had problems after World War II. Yeah, that's a really, that's quite a bit after the period that I discussed, but, but everyone who had anything to do with German in these lands had problems after World War II uh, to the point that, I mean, obviously there were some pretty intense resentments and there was, um, you know, it was essentially ethnic cleansing. Again, not really far out of my field of expertise, but there's very good work about that as well. Um, so yes, they did have, uh, they did have problems. And one of the things that I write about um, more extensively in my book is it's just this sense of like trying to make the right choice in language and somehow like always ending up being screwed no matter what you did, like there wasn't a good choice. Um, uh, was Kafka influenced by Meyerink? Uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> he, I mean, they were certainly around, whether it was a big influence, I, 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 would, I would doubt it. He's a pretty different kind of a writer, but uh, influence is diffuse. Um, how helpful did I find uh, Michal Marish's memoir? Well, as, as with anything that he said, um, like a number of people who write about Kafka, um, including uh, conversations with Kafka, if anything is verified, then it's helpful. If it's not verified, you kind of just have to discount it or say, yeah, maybe, you know, because, because although nobody's really paying much attention to Kafka during his life after he was dead and he came, I mean, now, you know, he's like the main industry there. I mean, you, you could claim, if you could claim acquaintance with Kafka, you could, you could help your career. Um, and so um, as, far as, as far as what he says about Kafka or what any of them say about Kafka, a grain of salt, I would say. Uh, is there, a good history of the development of the conflict between Czech and German culture and its conflict only language based or also based on religious differences like Catholics and Jews or other cultural identities. Well, it certainly wasn't only language based. And if it had been only language based, then the dynamic that we were just talking about where, you know, you couldn't really choose the right thing, um, the, the right language wouldn't have wouldn't have happened. There were many Czech Jews who assimilated successfully um, before the Holocaust and who were essentially Czech writers. Many people didn't even know that they were um, that they were Jewish and they weren't practicing, but um, that ultimately that, that didn't matter to the Nazis. Um, and so, yeah, as, as to what it was based on, I mean, what anti-Semitism is based on, 
I don't know. Like, it's a really long story. I wouldn't want to get get into that. But but one of the tensions, it's a liberal. It was a it was a liberal project to try and make these differences linguistic. If they were linguistic differences, they were not race hatred, and it was better. It was a proxy. It's a liberal project, um, but it it never really quite worked. To be honest. Um, that's that's not really how people. That's not really why people were hating on each other. All right. Uh, let's see. In my own reading of Kafka, I've always found it hard to discern his attitudes towards the newest Czechoslovak state. I think this is a theme. It is hard to discern his attitudes towards the new Czechoslovak state. Um, so again, I think I've answered. I answer this again. Like a little bit of both very hard. He was also, it's important to know, um, and I didn't really emphasize that so much today, for a lot of this period, Kafka was living outside. He was um, outside of Prague. He was trying to uh, heal in Italy, and then he was trying to heal in the High Tatras, and then he lived in Berlin for a time. So he was not always directly there, and he was not always paying attention to the politics, you know, of, of the day. He certainly I, he never showed any particular signs of caring all that much, I have to say. Um, but he was also dying of a terrible wasting disease, so he was distracted. Um, let's see. Did Kafka really live for a period of time in the Little Blue House on Golden Lane? Yes, he did. I have pictures of myself right there. Um, uh, I forget. I, I forget exactly what he wrote there. He, he only lived there for a short time. I'm sure I could. I'm sure I could find it out. But he lived there before before my time, so I don't know it as well. Yes, thank you. Chapkova is the author of the great book on um, on Czechs, Germans, and and Jews, and Hillel Kival. Um, yes, and he also he writes about um, Jew, uh, Jewish languages as well. His work is fantastic and really informed my own both of theirs. Totally recommend. I'm terrible with names. Totally recommend them, though. Um, were Kafka's lady interests what's influenced the role of females in his works? Yes and no. Uh, for instance, Greta in Metamorphosis and Frida in Das Urteil uh, uh, appeared very independent compared to the standard female roles at that time. Um, and it's safe to say that emancipated women in his life changed his view as women. I make a whole argument about Milena Yasinska and emancipated Czech women and the difference between the way that they were socialized and educated and the way that German women were and how much Milena Yasinska uh, influenced um, the women in, the, in Das Schloss. Uh, and um, not again, not one for one, not straight on. That would never happen. But there's a lot of textual evidence that that that, that he was thinking that down right down to like language, you know, overlap with some of Milena Yesenska's writings. Um, not to say that it became healthy. Like not to say that this just <laughs> cured it all and he was just fine. But yes, it definitely did. And I would say also in uh, uh, Josephine. Um, uh, you see a lot of that influence as well. Um, that's a big, actually, a big part of my argument. But since they weren't, since they weren't Jewish, I didn't really focus on that uh, today. Um, in my own research, I'm particularly interested in the ways that you use periodicals to reconstruct a history of Kafka that accounts for networking and encounter in print. This is not a question, but apropos of Nash Skautik, it reminded me of a neat little book I came across recently. Uh, thank you so much in the same series that published Karel Taiga's book. I'm definitely going to look at that. Um, it just, you know, sometimes when you're in ar archives, you just find things. And this was something that Max Broad misidentified. And I was like, ha! <laughs> um, <I'm not laughs> Thank you for noticing Nash Scout Geek. Uh, was Yiddish widely spoken in Prague? No, uh, it, it wasn't. Other further east in the in Slovakia, it, it was, but but mostly in the Czech lands, not very much, not very much Yiddish, German or, or Czech. Does does K? And I'm going to think we mean Kafka, not the character K from the Castle, <laughs> right? About Jews, you can make the argument. Lots of people do. Kafka's a little oblique, um, but certainly um, it is informed by all different kinds of resonances of, of, of Jewish culture, sure. Um, now, let's see, but also in the US. I'm not sure what that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as a follow-up, do you think the creation of the Czechoslovak state affected Kafka's literary production in any particular way? Uh, if so, how? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think I, 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 
half of my book is about the Schloss is about the castle and I think that the creation of the Czechoslovak state and the the issues that were wrapped up in that have everything to do with why the protagonist of that book is a land surveyor um, because issues of language and issues of land were like this like they were so closely united um, and so that that writing and land surveying being both things having to do with language, I think was a big was a big deal for him, and you don't see that uh, anywhere else. And also the idea that you go into there's this there's this community of, of speakers where everybody seems to understand each other, and then there's this this foreigner that comes there, but there's no sense that he actually is foreign. He's just not from there, but somehow he's a complete outsider. And I think that that has a lot to do with the idiot just the ideology of the nation state, and that you could have a community of people that speak the same language that just sort of magically also occupy the same land. Um, so that might be an answer to the formation of the Czechoslovak state, but I think it was more a critique of the nation state as ideology rather than particularly Czechoslovakia. Um, the, the name of a book I just mentioned again, which I just don't know which one it was. I hope it was Nash Skautik. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I think it's Czech Germans and Jews. I can, can I put a link to that in the, in the chat? Yep. I, I'll try and, I'll try and do that. Um, all right. Uh, did Jews in Czechoslovakia, well, did Jews definitely had citizenship in uh, the Kingdom of Bohemia and in the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and in fact, they, they, they were overall as a population loyal to the empire during World War I, which also caused them some problems, but they felt that the Kaiser had given them you know, more rights and had given them more benefits than they'd had previously, and so they were sort of grateful. Obviously not true for everyone, including not true for the Czech Jews who were Czech nationalists that we've talked about, but it was an overall broad trend. Um, what is the what was the reaction to the publication of translations of Kafka stories in the Czech press or literary world during his lifetime? It was like this. <laughs> there wasn't much. Um, a few, you know, a few people here and there. Um, but overall, he was not well known in his lifetime, even in German, and certainly not in Czech. In these little circles um, that I've mentioned, though, I mean, certainly his name was getting around. It's like, oh, this is a really interesting one. We should be publishing him. Um, and um, But by this point, he was less active in sort of the cafe circuit than he had been earlier because he was ill um, and old. Er, I mean, he felt himself to be very old. He was not that old, but he felt himself to be old. All right, I think, oh, is that, is that it? Um, yes. Uh, okay, I, I think, is that all the questions? I think, could I just take, sure. I, I just, uh, I was, and just to express my thank for, thanks for the, the really fascinating stuff you found in, in the Czech publications. That, that, that just was great. And the Ladislav Klima, uh, I would encourage you to think about a, a common point between Klima and Kafka being masochism. <laughs> I think, I, yeah, I think that you, you could, you could find them. It's just on the face of it. Yeah. You know, but, but, but you know, the other thing, and this sounds facetious, but it certainly wouldn't have been for Kafka, the way that their names are kind of the same, like that was, <laughs> that would have caused him to sit up and take notice. Um, but the, the other question I had in connection with that is whether in your research you um, came across any evidence of either personal or, or professional connections between Kafka and uh, the Czech Jewish Jewish assimilationist movement, uh, in the people who put out the, the Czech Jewish calendar and those publications? I, I did not. I did not. I didn't. I, and it doesn't mean that there isn't there it isn't there anywhere, but I didn't see anything like, I mean, really he didn't have very much to do in terms of the record that we have. He didn't have that much to do with Czech culture before this time, a little here and there, like there was this neighbor or, you know, he wrote translations to uh, uh, Felice Bauer, his fiance of like the stationery. I mean, you know, and he, he was going, he was, he was, uh, I don't know, he was an insurance adjuster, not exactly, but a risk, risk assessment. And so he was going and like dealing with Czech workers and talking to them and stuff but but he really wasn't that 
there's, I mean, Marek Nekula, uh, who's another person who's done really extensive, extensive, fabulous work on Kafka and, and languages, in particular Kafka and Czech, does more on the early side and makes a strong case about uh, Kafka's education and the way that he would have been educated, took, you know, Czech like a secondary school subject, Czech literature. So he would have known the classics, like he, would, he knew Božena Nemcova, uh, he knew uh, Vrchlitsky, he was reading Vrchlitsky's uh, letters and Nemcova's letters and sort of so like these big sort of titanic uh, uh he knew he knew milana yesenska's aunt ruzhina yesenska so he would know like the earlier generation um but he didn't know really the contemporaries um as well and and so he knew um he knew some of the people because they were around in the cafes but th but he wasn't he wasn't a part of that circle well, um, maybe uh, we should uh, all thank our, our speaker, Anne. Uh, it was a great, uh, a great talk, and uh, we, thank you so much for presenting. And uh, for oh, wait, wait, there's, there's Veronica Tokarova. Oh. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> Ciao, well, you, <laughs> Sorry, I guess I just you'll have, have to take that one. Uh, Frantisek and Yuji Langer might be a good link uh, to Czech culture and writing much earlier. Why? Why? Yes, I talk about that to. Uh, fairly extensively uh, in my book and didn't mention their names, but uh, Franciszek Langer was the, uh, the, the Czech Jewish writer who became uh, very close friends with uh, not just Chapek, but the, the president. He was part of that Friday men or the Friday group that Masaryk uh, would join. It was very, really recognized as a Czech writer. I mean, I know when I was studying Czech literature, way back in the day, I read him as a Czech writer and nobody mentioned to me that he was Jewish. I, I didn't have any idea <laughs> until much later. Whereas Yuzhi Langer was the one who, um, who became a sort of a, a Jewish mystic and uh, was Kafka's more particular friend, but he knew Franciszek Langer um, through, uh, through Yuzhi. Um, and uh, and that, that sort of, the, that was, you know, two brothers in one family. And it's, it's a very interesting story overall. And I think there's somebody writing a book about it maybe now. Well, <laughs> maybe okay, now sorry, we Sorry, I didn't want to blow up it on <laughs> Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, naturally. Um, and uh, Pavla, I'm so glad to see that your building is not burned down. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Yeah, and, no. And I just want to give you a chance if there, if there was a specific announcement you wanted to make about yeah. an upcoming event. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to thank Anne very much for this wonderful lecture. I'm sorry I missed the first half of it, but I was trying to catch up. And I would like um, to thank Christopher for filling out for me uh, without much much time and advance notice but it was fine there was smoke the fire guards came but we didn't have to evacuate the building in the end and it's okay now but so thank you thank you so much um i'd like to know uh, i'd like to let know everybody that the lecture will be available on youtube and we will send information to everybody who rsvp'd for tonight in upcoming days when when we will post it and also, I, mm -hmm. could I could I just say to that to yeah. anybody who is here, and I don't know if there are people who are listening, um, who may be listening in the future, who might have wished that I spoke more slowly um, because English <laughs> is not their first language. If you would like to write to me for you know uh, for notes or like the slides are available, obviously much of what I talked about uh, is available in my book, but 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 not all of it. And I have a I have a lot of. I have a lot of stuff from Czech archives, so you know if you if you if you are doing research and you want to be in touch uh, with me, I'm really happy to hear from you. Thank you, and thank you, thank you so much, and thank um, you so much for having me. Thank you, it's our pleasure. And so before we say goodbye, um, our the next event of the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews will take place on Sunday, November twenty second. And um, it will be a lecture by uh, Martin Schmock, Czech documentary filmmaker and independent researcher. The title of the presentation is The Prague Roots of the Father of the Refugees. And uh, Martin will be sharing excerpts from his new book about Charles Jordan, the executive vice president of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. So I hope uh, we will be sending invitations and I hope that all of you will be able to join us. Um, thank you so much. Um, stay safe and well, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all soon again.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.